linguistics. If you think about languages, for example, how a word or a concept has different meanings over time. That's what I was interested in in that song, Filipino Baby. When we think synchronically, though, we're hoping to think about one particular time period, but then it forces us to consider all the various contexts that inform that particular time period. So for you, your time period, that will be what? That will be the 2010s, the 2020s. You'll refer back to, as me as a middle-aged person, referring back to the 1980s, you'll be referring to this particular time period. And hopefully what you'll do is you'll be able to refer to the various changes that are going on structurally to the economy, to religion, to culture, to politics. Right? There are multiple ways to think about one particular time period. And that's, for me, what this record collection is about. Um, and I'm hoping to, to think about this with you. If you have other research projects, I'd actually be interested to hear from you what you're working on uh, as we consider these two different cultural objects. Um, synchronic versus a diachronic one. For both, I'm very much interested in how our context is as much as, is as important as our content. Thank you very much. Questions, comments, or even other research projects you might be working on, things you want to consider. Yes. Paradigm records. I discovered. I didn't discover the entire collection. What happened is I was listening to one album by the Asian American musicians you've been hearing about, Grain of Sand. Um, that was an album that was released in 1973. When I was an undergraduate at a college in, uh, in Northern California, uh, Santa Clara University. That's where I did my undergrad. I had a professor bring in that, this particular album and start thinking about music and the histories of Asian Americans in that album. I kept that album close with me because it was a really great way to think about identity and Asian American history. I looked, of course, on the label and it said Paradigm Records. Okay, big deal. I kind of filed it away. Like everything else, it's incidental. Years later, I would come uh, up to San Francisco to do my master's degree uh, at, at San Francisco State. And another set of activists who were working in the Filipino community turned on another album to me. And it was the album uh, uh, created by anti-martial law activists. And it was an album on Philippine revolutionary songs, released 1977. And it's in a really strident, hyper-political style. It's almost all marches. And it's about marching to victory with the, the blood-stained red flag of, of, the, of the movement. Uh, and there's a, a brilliant version of Bayan Ko on it, which is a patriotic song about country and patriotism. I look on the back, it's with Paragon Records. Again, I didn't really connect it, filed it away. Years later, I, I moved to Honolulu because I, I got a chance to teach at the University of Hawaii at Manoa starting in fall 2002. And one of the first meetings that I had was with Chris Kijima, who was a member of that trio, uh, Grain of Sand. And he, he and I sat down. And he was teaching law there at the University of Hawaii Law School. And I was like a very, uh, I was like a little puppy uh, because I was so enamored with Chris Ujima. He was, to me, uh, a great hero for being a pioneer musician as well as an activist. And when he sang and when he played, he was really quite soulful. He uh, passed away a few years later. We were neighbors in Hawaii for many years. But when I first met him, again, it's like, what do you do when you meet your heroes? What do you do when you meet people who you've only heard about, and you get a chance now to share some coffee with them? And I'm trying to keep my cool. <laughs> trying to keep it together. I had so many questions to ask, and all I said to him was, can you sign my CD, please? I didn't even have the original album. I just had a CD re-release of the album. He signed it, and he said, it's great to have you here. Let's keep in touch. And uh, I realized, as I moved back, to the original album, that both of those LPs were on the same record collection. So we fast forward a few years later, I learned that Chris had passed away of a rare blood disease. And for many in the Hawaii community, in the, in the activist community up and down California, this was a major, major loss. And I think especially for other musicians, it was a huge loss. Um, so I, I turned again to that album, and I found the, the vinyl LP with Paragon again, 
And uh, at this point, I decided that I would, I would try to figure out a way to write about Paragon Records as a whole. So I ended up getting a, a postdoctoral fellowship at the Smithsonian, where the entire collection is now deposited with Smithsonian. So you can go online to Smithsonian Folkways. It was acquired in 1991. All 50 albums are available, including all liner notes. And you can purchase the entire collection single by single. So when I became a fellow, there was some money that came with it, uh, but I decided I was going to buy the entire collection. I needed to have this for myself. And uh, of course, Chris's album was in there. Uh, and for me, it's a, it's a way to connect to people like Chris, uh, to connect with the, the things that I care about the most. Questions, comments? Sorry, I'm getting y'all getting all emotional. <laughs> Yes, sir. So can you listen to the albums and the music online? Can you stream them or do you have to purchase them? You can, you can um, um, stream uh, samples. There are 30 second samples for each track. And I believe on YouTube there are um, the same samples. So whether you go to the Smithsonian Folkways website or to YouTube, you'll find it there. But go to Smithsonian Folkways, the website will come up. And then in the, they have, there are several record labels that the Smithsonian has acquired. There are 13 Smithsonian owns outright, and so this becomes one of the collections. And this is the, this is the one that they made available for public use. So when I became a fellow, all of the the entire collection was all of the the archives were made available to me. So I went into the dusty archives of the Smithsonian to find this thing, and you find the original liner notes and the agreements with the label owners and the musicians. It's a fantastic collection. So I'm hoping to tell part of that story. Yes, sir, back. Um, hi, uh, so this is kind of tangential, but I'm kind of interested in um, these minority studies in the idea of reconciliation with the whole, um, like the whole society, um, or people who are still interested in trying to do that. And um, I think like a big thing in these ATM classes, especially at school, you know, where you have people like Frank Wilderson and other great thinkers with Afro-pessimism and these kinds of ideas that even these identities are you know, hurting people and not really, um, or are missing the point in some ways. Um, I'm really interested in this kind of critical thinking, like Asian thinking, on um, like these white songs and this, these kind of racist kind of ideas, but where does that thinking leave um, something that isn't negative to say, or that isn't, I mean, it's important to say these things, but it's, this, is, this this kind of thinking, like you mentioned, that um, in the 70s, there's this big draw against um, that men, these white men, you know, whether they were womanizing the rest of the world or not, um, that they were away from their families, right? And this right. was kind of a sentiment that, um, you know, seemed like it, you weren't just attacking, you know? Like, is there any room for this kind of thinking or think about these songs that isn't, you know, attacking their assumptions and their racism and, you know, the other? The thinking, what kind of thinking? Um, uh, 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 through the lens of a minority, through the lens of critical uh, minority studies. Yeah, let's 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 consider this. Asian American identities falls along a very wide spectrum, and there are numbers a number of ways of identifying with majority cultures or disidentifying with majority cultures. Sometimes there are voices within. <coughs> all of these racial communities, including African American, Chicago Latino, Native American, and the rest, that identify with the majority culture and others that outright reject it. So there's not one way to be an Asian American in that sense. There is, I think, an interesting way to kind of think about it historically. How has the consciousness or the expressive identities of various Asian persons or persons of Asian descent changed over time? And for what reasons did they change? Is there any lesson that we can learn about thinking about someone like Pearl Harbor for attacking the song but with a sense of irony, rather than not singing the song at all and maybe singing something else? Is there any utility of that song for us at this time? Um, it might make sense to talk to Pearl Harbor about that and think, were you using, were you attempting to use the or rework that Greek concept of irony for your own ends? Maybe, maybe not. But that's not necessarily how culture works. Oftentimes what happens is that these cultural objects come into being and that other fans, students, other voices come and seize upon 
those particular objects and use it for their own ends. Right? So even the cultural objects themselves may not necessarily, the, the cultural objects themselves will have conflicted, contradictory, multiple meanings. It's still incumbent upon different readers and listeners and other critics and artists to interpret and constantly reinterpret the meanings, whatever use, whatever utility these cultural objects might have for them. So it's these things don't exist in the abstract. They are mobilized and then they're rejected, right? Just like any symbol you can think about. Uh, Stuart Hall, the, the British thinker, used to think about this idea of swastikas being worn by by um, by young Thai teenagers uh, toward the end of his life. And someone asked him, "What do you think about that? The swastika in your time, it really meant something as a young person to see." This, this symbol of hate. And he says, well, yes, it, at one point it was a symbol of hate. Um, but he says, it may not mean anything, though. You ask this young Thai kid what it means, and he's talking about a young Thai teenager who's just sporting a necklace, uh, and they're standing at a, 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 a SkyTrain station in the middle of Bangkok. He said, it's very well, it very well could be that it means absolutely nothing. Right? At that point, well, what then is the political utility to think about mobilizing against it? What does it mean then to call that person out for being a racist? And he cautioned us to say, it's like, that's not necessarily the case. You don't know anything necessarily about how that person is using that particular symbol. But then he ended his comment, but, <laughs> right? That is the, that's the fraught nature of what culture is about. Culture is not necessarily a political, cultural statements are not necessarily political statements. Cultural statements roam the ground in terms of signification. They can mean something, it can mean something else at another time. But it becomes political when people decide to mobilize resources, to reshape identities for a particular end. This kid that's hanging out on SkyTrain station, it may have zero end in itself. But for the rest of us that are interested in changing those ends, creating a different future, a different present, then we get into the realm of politics to harness resources, to change people's minds, and to envision a different future. That, for me, is a difference between culture and politics that oftentimes gets blurred. Not everything on the field of culture is in battle for politics. Now, I think the same thing can be said for much of Asian American music. I think a lot of times we're thinking about these cross-identifications. And you think of a singer like Flip Nunez, this uh, Filipino jazz player of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. He often had to play, he often would play in working class neighborhoods and clubs with other African Americans. It turned out to be, for him, um, a way to keep playing with some of the best musicians that were coming in through town. But it also meant that he wasn't getting the highest wages that he could because he wasn't playing with the white musicians. His preference actually was to play with more white musicians. Not because he was racist and he felt a tinge of anti-blackness. It was because he wanted a wage to live on. And he saw the segregated nature of Stockton and San Francisco in the clubs that he was playing in. It turned out that he actually gained a ton of skills whenever the Duke Ellington Orchestra would come through and stop over in Stockton. That was the life that he led. For him, it was not a political statement. He was trying to get a gig. We can look back on this and think, ah, black Filipino solidarity. Well, he wasn't necessarily thinking in those terms, right? He was thinking in terms of surviving, keeping home and heart together for many, many years. And it turned out he just he ended up uh, teaching many people a lesson about what actually are the most important lessons for being a musician, which is to keep playing and to get better at it again and again and again. So in my uh, estimation, these notions of culture and politics are oftentimes too blurred, too often blurred, when in reality um, they are much more tentative than we really uh, are, are giving them their due. I think that we're at that moment right now with a lot of... Um, uh, the culture today for Asian American culture, especially with the culinary world, when so many Asian Americans are out making names for themselves in the culinary field, and others are writing about it. Again, it's an interesting time to be, I think, an Asian American, if you identify with that term. No many of you Any other questions or comments? Sure. of a record, the liner notes, the music. Yeah. And so in terms of like your approach to a collection of this size, like how do you think 
musically, lyrically, materially about the objects? Yeah. Or if that's like a part of your... Yeah, well, one one chapter that I want to focus on actually focuses less on the lyrics. Primarily, I'm focusing on the lyrical content. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a way to kind of look at this musicologically, which is considered tempo, types of instruments used, arrangements and whatnot. Not interested necessarily in the musicological approach to it. I'm interested in what the lyrics are telling you. So in that sense, it is, it, it's more about the themes that are generated from the lyrics. There is another angle which is important to me, because it, it, um, it dawned on me later that the album art is something that the LP uh, really highlighted. And for most of the images, uh, most of the covers on, uh, on Paradigm, they were actually done by one artist by the name of Ron Klein. However, there are several other LPs that were designed by other um, artists of note. And uh, one was by uh, uh, an artist by the name of Jane Norling up in um, the Oakland area. And at the time when I got a chance to interview her, so this is a short way to say that I'm actually trying to write also about the visual cues as, that comes out of the album. Because many of them have a very um, uh, arresting um, visual uh, symbol uh, and, and vocabulary. Right? Uh, they're really trying to draw your attention to uh, the vibrancy of revolutions that are taking place around the world. So Ron Klein, as the um, album designer for most of the Smithsonian's LPs, and he designed thousands of LP covers, really excelled at images and text. And so you could find this will be an example. I guess this one, this is one example. These are very, uh, the, these images are most striking. But then there are other artists that I wanted to talk to because he didn't design all of the album art. And uh, I spoke, got a chance to speak with Jane Norling, who is um, a graphic designer up in the San Francisco Bay Area. She works out of Oakland. She has a studio. She continues to work. I asked her about that time when she designed one LP by a band called Red Star Singers out of Berkeley. And they were a radical white quartet of uh, singers from the Bay Area at the time. And she was in the mix, Jane Norling, as a graphic designer. For her, she understood graphic design to be part of the revolutionary activities. So she, I got a chance to tour her studio, and much of that work has, has to do with Latino communities, Asian American communities. You could see her working closely with especially a lot of Filipino activists in the San Francisco Bay Area. She worked a lot with, with Asian Americans and Filipino Americans in San Francisco. And for her, graphic design was part of, of uh, the vocabulary. It was absolutely needed in order to rally and mobilize and draw your attention to the urgency of, of many of these campaigns. The other artist that I got a chance to speak with is uh, the Palestinian artist, uh, Kamal Bulata, who's also a poet uh, and a wonderful artist in his own right. And he contributed his own uh, illustrations to the Palestinian album that is, uh, is really just uh, gorgeous and outstanding. He was, really, he was dissatisfied with the color separation from the LP, but he created a whole new artwork for the, the two Palestine albums that were released. Um, so in terms of the materiality, when you think about the LP, what we've lost since moving away from that into the CDs and eventually to nothing, uh, to just a digital file, is the fact that at some point many of us would display these LP covers. 12 by 12, it really takes up quite a lot of space. Yeah? And so um, I have now about a third of the original vinyl LPs uh, in my house. So in addition to having this, the CD collection. Uh, but again, visually it's quite arresting. And so I wanted to be able to, to comment on that and to talk about the visual aspect, these artists, here's what they're working on. Inside each of the 50 LPs was a booklet, anywhere from 12 to 28 pages. And the idea was that each booklet would summarize the politics of that particular country, the statements about the music of that community, of the band itself. All of it was translated into English, because primarily all of these albums were distributed for English-speaking communities. And again, the idea was that the bands could create an album almost out of nothing, with hardly any front capital, um, have an album, say like 100 and 200 vinyl LPs, and then be part of a rally or a protest or a festival. And they could sell the LPs on their own. At the same time, you could learn about what's happening in Ecuador or in Nicaragua or in the Philippines. So it was an organizing tool. The booklets became an organizing tool as opposed to merely being entertainment. So when you think about world music, this is not the kind of Latin jazz that you're listening to in Starbucks. Uh, that's passive entertainment. This was music to activate communities uh, at rallies and at demonstrations. When you think about the Grain of Sand trio, they would perform concerts up and down 
uh, the East Coast. And at the end of each performance, they would gather the students and the community activists in the room. It was not merely a concert for entertainment's sake, but the idea is the singers were interested in what are the local issues happening here. And they would ask the students, what is happening here in Irvine that needs to change? And they would spend hours after the concert. And so it was an organizing tool. It was a consciousness-raising opportunity for people to think about uh, music and social change. It's very different from just merely liking a track and then moving on. Other questions or comments? artificial one that I'm drawing, but the point is that not all cultural statements are necessarily political ones. It could be the fact that these statements made by, the, by these K-pop singers are actually reinforcing racist <coughs> stereotypes, and what's certainly the case is that you can see how different cultural expressions do similar things. You can reinforce. But what, is it, what does that really mean? The reinforcement of a stereotype is it in and of itself is not a public policy position. It may not necessarily change people's minds. It might be detrimental to people's health and well-being, but you'd have to find examples of that to understand certain effects. So you can make a statement that is quite clear in saying that it can reinforce or it participates in a tradition in popular culture that reinforces these uh, racist stereotypes. And there's a long history in the academic uh, literature that talks about how culture has done so. Um, but you have to turn to other parts of the culture to find out where the reinforcement of ideas actually hurts people's well-being and lives. If you think about the Brown versus Board of Education case in 1954, the original case was brought by a plaintiff on behalf of his daughter, Olivia Brown, a young girl who was going to a segregated school. And social science work that they brought in before that court was the doll test by, the, by a, a couple of, of psychologists, African-American psychologists, who wanted to test the effects of what it has of what segregation has on the lives of the racial preferences of young children. So they would place white dolls and black dolls in front of a multiracial um, informant. And these respondents to the study would always, almost always prefer the white doll over the black. And that would include even young black children pref pref uh, preferring the white doll. And this, they were claiming, as a result of this Clark doll test, was a way of reinforcing how these attitudes in society would reinforce prejudice among young children. Because what's true about young children is that they don't really tell lies. Right? They're really quite honest. They can try to get out of things. But they're also very honest about their racial preferences. So you think about the social science history in terms of the historiography, how the, the literature actually allows us to think about the detrimental effects of images in society and how uh, and how that's reflected in our, our choices, well, they had to come up with the evidence for that to demonstrate that that was the case. That segregation, segregated schools, actually produces outcomes of low self-esteem among certain students. We can't really just kind of say that out of the air. You have to demonstrate the evidence for it. And that was the evidence that they used to overturn the existing law of the land that had been the law of the land since 1896. Think how powerful that statement was. To be able to turn to the effects of segregation, right? Because the premise had been, as long as it's separate, as long as it's equal, it can be separate, right? We can separate train cars, separate schools, and whatnot. But you understand the difference between a separate white campus and a separate black campus, that in reality, the resources are so askew that hardly anyone could get a fair shake in the latter campus. So again, it's possible to make a statement. Yes, it participates. It comes from a long tradition. But if you're asking what are the kinds of effects 
um, that is borne out from those statements, that would require a different set of uh, conditions for research, I think. Other questions or comments? Yes, Dr. Balance. I think in a really question, go back to the question. Um, if also, I mean, you opened up your talk with talking about you, know, you yourself and how you uh, experienced or encountered the song for the first time, right? Um, and how that encounter included a kind of reactivating of this, you know, soldier's memory, yeah. right? And so, so I guess too, in terms of you know, you also mentioned kind of the listener, and if you think about the critic as a listener, right, and all of us critics, um, and the ways in which we listen, right, uh, or encounter this music. But that's my kind of long-winded way of getting back to um, the way you ended, and it was kind of quick, um, with Pearl Harbor's version, right, of my little female baby. And I wondered if you could maybe, I don't know, talk through the ways you're trying to think about how, I mean, it's beyond the irony, right, and of what, what it might mean that this is, um, Maybe the product of the encounter, right, of my like, Filipino baby and the singer, yeah. or who was maybe the original singer or intended singer for so long, yeah. right, and her being the product of that, number one. But then also, number two, we were talking a little bit about the history of Mukulai Gardens, <laughs> because we could also think about that, right, as another place, um, a, a site of cultural repurposing. Sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I. I when I discovered the fact that Pearl Harbor uh, had also sung this, this particular song, it, 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 uh, it got me to think about why the other songs, why the other versions of the songs were so popular. And again, the idea is that the song is really about promising a soldier another love in the future. If I could sing this about my Filipino baby, here's what you can expect in the future. So there's almost kind of like a purchase that's given to a future generation of soldiers. And what became clear to me as I was listening to the songs that I don't think Pearl Harbor is setting up a future engagement with another soldier. She's not forward thinking in that sense. She's not handing it off. It's not the patrimony of a soldier from one soldier to the next. Here, fellas, let me, let's gather around and we'll talk about my Filipino baby. And for you new recruits, this is what you can expect. Because that's really the education of how you go from one generation of soldiers to the next. What to expect in order to survive. Right? Um, this is what's owed to you for your military service. I don't, it seemed to me that that chain of promises ended with her version. And the irony of the fact that it's also sung by a Filipino woman singing for other new wave kids in the 1980s to me was quite interesting. I'm, I'm not claiming that she says that it stops here, but that promise, the idea that the song has this generative promise that is held out for soldier to soldier um, is, um, is something that to me it somehow ended. And that, to me, was more important. Uh, Mogulhai Gardens was a, a, a club in San Francisco that was really the ground zero for the, the punk movement of its day in the, in the 1980s. And so just about every important group, even unimportant group, even horrible groups performed at Mogulhai Gardens. And it was owned by, um, a, it was actually a Filipino restaurant that featured uh, these punk acts and new wave acts and theatrical acts on the weekends. Um, I don't know what more you wanted to, to say about that. I mean, these are, in many ways, these are incubators for ideas, these clubs. Um, they, allow, they allow musicians to get better at what they're doing. Uh, Christina and I used to play at, in a band called Bobby Venduria, and we were part of a theater troupe that for many years in San Francisco Bay Area didn't have a permanent space for its Filipino artists. And the, the bad thing about that is that if you're a musician and you don't have a steady place to practice your craft, you'll sound like a shitty musician. But if you have a place, and if you have a place that's controlled by others that are like-minded thinkers, you can go to that place and you can continue to get better at it. And what we found, especially with a couple of our friends who put together this rolling concert over the years, twice a year they put something together called Pinoy's Pop. They had no idea, the organizers of this festival, they had no idea that twice a year, uh, it turned out that there were dozens of Filipino bands that were playing all throughout the Bay Area. They were just playing in their backyards and their living rooms. They weren't getting necessarily any better at it. But the permissive attitude of being in a club served as an incubator because twice a year, bands like our own could expect that they were going to go in front of people. So they upped their game. And you got better at what you were doing. You presented yourself better. You gained confidence. You shared instruments. You developed a network. You developed a community. If you lost an instrument or if yours wasn't working, you could use someone else's. 
It taught you the value of community because it was very real. You were going to perform on that stage, and if you <coughs> didn't get it together, you were going to look like an idiot. It didn't stop people from making them look like an idiot, but it gave people the confidence to go on and on, and some of the bands actually got quite better at it. So by the time the theater was threatened with its own extinction toward the redevelopment phase, and of course prices are, are so out of skew there with the market that, um, that the theater was sitting on some very valuable property, it became important for a community to retain business of studio because they saw the positive attributes of that location, not just as an incubator for Filipino arts, but because people were going there for very good and positive reasons. We created something that was positive and forward-looking. And so that is not something that's abstract. When I say that Christine and I helped to build the community, that is not abstract. We shared resources with each other. And when the theater was under threat, the community raised its political voice to try to save it. They, moved, they mobilized a politi in, a, in that particular political moment. I can tell you before that time, I don't know how many of us were thinking politically about the fact that we're in the middle of a working class neighborhood and Filipino bands are trying to get it together. For me at least, it wasn't necessarily a political statement. But when the chips were down and when the theater needed support, the politics did its work. It anticipated what was necessary in that political moment. And that you could fill a room of this size in front of the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco. That to me was the notion that the cultural work that we had been doing paved the way for the political moment we needed. So in my mind, they're not synonymous. Right? The culture of Biddlestead could have gone several different ways. Right? Um, it is, at, the result, at, at its base, a place for people to learn their craft. But the question is, what happens when stuff really goes down in the community? Hopefully you've done the homework with your community to build the culture Anyway, that's what, for me, it's like that's what the that's why cultural work is so important, and there's no there's no distinct conclusion to it. Um, unlike the conclusion we will have with this election, there will be a conclusion on November eighth. But the the cultural work of how people are continually locked out of resources, who continue to hurt in every neighborhood, in every suburb, in every diaspora community. That will continue beyond November 8th. That's when the cultural work continues again. So don't think that November 8th is just the conclusion. That's the political conclusion to one particular season. The cultural work continues. So the question is, you up for the hard stuff? Because that lasts. How are we doing? Thank you so much.